Okay, maybe that was a little bit too fast. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. This is gonna be part four in my video series on developing an electronic lead screw for my lathe, which when it's finished will allow me to change thread pitches and feed rates just by pressing a button and not having to mess around with change gears. Now, if you haven't seen the other videos in this series, you might wanna check those out first. All of this may make more sense if you've seen them. Today, we're gonna to take a look at the motor to drive the lead screw. I've got a couple of options on the bench. I've got a stepper motor and a servo motor. We're gonna look at the differences between those. We're going to look at the circuitry to interface those to the microcontroller, and we'll do some bench testing. In previous videos, you've seen me messing around with a little NEMA 14 stepper motor and this little Allegro A4988 driver. Um, now, this was not ever intended to be used on the lathe, though maybe I didn't do a good job of communicating that because I got more than one comment, uh, people saying, you're gonna need a bigger motor, a lot bigger motor. And yeah, that's true. This motor is not gonna turn anything on the lathe, uh, at least not in any practical way. So I do have a bigger motor. This is one of the motors that I'm thinking about using. This is a NEMA 24, which is sort of an oddball metric size stepper motor and a driver for that. And this is what I had originally planned to use on the lathe. Now I also have, if I can get the cables untangled, I also have a NEMA 23 servo that I'm also planning to do some testing with. So I thought today we would take a look at the interface hardware that's used to connect the microcontroller to the stepper driver or with the servo, the servo driver through the opto isolated inputs and then play around with the stepper motor and the stepper driver and play around with the servo and the servo driver and see what we can learn. Let's start with the stepper motor. This is the stepper motor. This is the one that came off of my mill when I replaced the Z motor with a NEMA 34. This is a NEMA 24 motor. Now, NEMA 23 is a standard size that most people are familiar with. The NEMA 24 is a little bit different. Instead of a quarter inch shaft, it has an eight millimeter shaft. And this one has about 600 ounce inches of torque. It's about four Newton meters of torque. And this is from a Chinese supplier. I don't even remember exactly where I got these. It's, a, it's a, a, a low dollar motor. These weren't very expensive. And then to drive it, I've got a bipolar stepper motor driver. Now this one from Automation Technology is a 32-bit DSP-based driver. I had played around originally with analog drivers and had some success, but I was losing steps on my mill. And so I switched over to these KL5056D drivers. These have DSPs in them, and they actually monitor the current loop on the motor and make adjustments that allow them to run the motor much quieter. They can adjust to the actual inductance and electrical characteristics of the motor, and they do a lot better job of killing uh, mid-range um, resonance on the motor, which is a common cause of lost steps. Now the interface on this, uh, you have the four wires for the motor, the A plus and minus and the B plus and minus for the two coils in the motor, plus the high voltage, the ground and the plus, uh, in this case, 48 volts DC that we're gonna drive it with. There's a bunch of switches for setting the uh, steps and micro steps. In this case, I have it set for eight to one micro stepping and I have a set to cut the motor current in half when it's just resting, when it's not turning. And then the connections up here are the inputs. And the way this works is there's an input for pulse, there's an input for direction, and there's an input for enable that turns the power to the motor on and off. And so you ultimately, to take a step, you apply a pulse to the pulse pins and you control which direction that step is gonna be based on the polarity of the signal to the direction pins. Let me grab a schematic and let's talk about how this actually works and how it's connected to the microcontroller. Okay, so if we look at the driver, this over here is the driver, and I've only shown one of the inputs, but there's three. There's the enable, the step, and the direction. There's also an output for alarm. This is more for the servo driver. We'll talk about that in a little bit. 
the way this works is it is optically isolated. So since the driver's running on high voltage, in this case 48 volts DC, but you know it could be much higher, um, you don't want the signals from your 3.3 volt microcontroller going directly into that circuitry and interfacing with it both because you don't want noise being transmitted back and also because you don't want to risk high voltage getting shunted back into the microcontroller. So what these drivers have in them is actually an opto isolator. There's an LED and a resistor that are hooked up to the input pins on the outside and then that LED shines across onto a phototransistor. Now in reality this is all within one chip, within an opto isolator chip and then that actually switches the logic inside the driver. So all we have to do with the microcontroller is just drive an LED. Now this particular TI microcontroller will source, meaning when it outputs logic high, it will drive about three milliamps, which is not very much, and it's only at 3.3 volts. And so that's not enough to reliably light an LED when we don't know the characteristics of that LED. These are designed to be run at 5 volts. There's a 270 ohm resistor in here. If you want to run it on a higher voltage, you have to provide an external resistor to limit the current. But this driver is set up assuming that you're going to provide 5 volts to this LED. And it's going to draw whatever it's going to draw, 15 milliamps, 25 milliamps, something like that. We could look that up in the spec sheet and know for sure. But it's way more current and at a higher voltage than what the microcontroller can put out. So we're going to use a FET transistor as a switch. And this is just a, uh, just a standard field effect transistor. These are the same ones that we talked about last week for the level converters, which will be really handy if you're building this board to have all the transistors be the same. And that'll either be the BSS-138, which is a surface mount chip, or the 2N7000, which is a through-hole version. So we've got this set up as a traditional switch. One side of the LED is connected to the positive 5 volts, and in order to turn the LED on, we have to switch the other side of the LED to ground. So the field effect transistor is set up between the negative side of the LED and the ground, and when we provide a positive signal on the, um, on the gate, the transistor switches on, and that switches on the LED. When the signal on the gate goes low, the transistor switches off, the LED switches off. So this is just a standard logic level gate. Now, a field effect transistor uses an electrical field for switching, so there is actually no current flowing through the gate like there would be in the base of a bipolar transistor. However, the gate does have capacitance and so when you initially change its state by going high and charging it up or by taking your line low and discharging it, there will be a current spike. And so we've got a resistor here, and this is 1K, 1.5K. I think I'm gonna use a 1.5K resistor here just to limit the amount of current that's gonna be drawn out of the microcontroller just to protect that input. And then also to protect the input of the microcontroller, I've got a 50 picofarad capacitor over here between the wire where it exits the board and ground, and that's just there to absorb RF or to absorb um, electrostatic discharge to try to protect the transistor. These are pretty bulletproof because they have a, a lot of area on the chip, and especially to protect the microcontroller. Now, ideally, there would be another resistance here in series to allow this transistor, or allow this capacitor to act as a low-pass filter and remove RF more effectively, but I don't really want to do that because all I have is 5 volts and this resistor in the driver is sized properly for 5 volts and I don't, I don't want to risk getting into conditions where it's not actuated reliably, so I'm just going to leave that alone. Now the alarm is exactly the opposite. The LED is connected to the electronics inside the servo driver and when we get that we can look at that. Um, and it's actuating an isolated transistor, which is doing exactly the same thing. We're switching to ground here. This is switching a signal line to ground to trigger the microcontroller that an alarm has occurred. So we just have a pull, a 10K pull up uh, to make that go high unless this switches on to pull it down and that gives us our logic level signal. We've got a, another 50 picofarad capacitor here just for noise filtering and electrostatic immunity.
and then I've also put a 10K resistor since there's gonna be almost no current draw on this pin. That just gives us more protection for the microcontroller if a high voltage spike comes in or if it gets driven at some uh, signal level that's inappropriate for the microcontroller. It'll provide some measure of protection and it's cheap protection. So let's hook this thing up and see how it runs. This is the enable pins. This is the step and direction. And we've got the power and the motor. Okay, so the interesting thing here is gonna be the speed curve. So if we're looking at a 12 thread per inch lead screw on the lathe, then if I set this to cut a 12 thread per inch thread, that's gonna have the lead screw turning exactly in sync with the spindle. Because if we wanna go 12 threads per inch, then we need to turn a 12 uh, thread per inch lead screw 12 times per inch. So it'll end up being one to one. And that's exactly what we get. Those arrows are tracking each other exactly. And if we reverse direction, they don't track exactly, but they, uh, they, they move one revolution. So on the lathe, we're not gonna see tremendous acceleration speeds because the spindle has a limited, um, it has inertia and it's only gonna spin up so fast. So here on the bench, I can start and stop this much more quickly than the spindle on the lathe is actually gonna start and stop. Now for the stepper motor, I have this set up right now um, so that it's designed to be geared one to one to the lathe. And that's because stepper motors do not do well at high speeds. As the speed of the motor increases, you run a, the torque decreases and you run a much higher risk of losing steps. And so um, you typically wanna run these slower. So I'm thinking one to one is about what I want. That'll give me four uh, Newton meters of torque. I don't actually know if that's gonna be enough, but um, if I try to run the stepper faster and gear it down or use a belt drive to slow it down, then we're very rapidly gonna run into situations where I'm asking the stepper to go faster than it reliably can go. So if I set this to eight threads per inch, you can see that it's going quite a bit faster than the spindle encoder is. And in fact, I can flick it hard enough. I think I can make this miss some steps. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. I can make it lose sync and miss steps. Now you can see over here on the RPM gauge that I'm getting it over a thousand RPM and doing it almost instantaneously. So that's unrealistic. It is never gonna pop up that fast. You can hear the fan in the power supply over there. It'll cool down here in a second and slow down. That's unrealistic. We're never gonna accelerate and decelerate like that on the lathe, but how fast can this thing really go? Especially with the torque and what happens when we close the half nut on the lathe and the shot comes through the system, is the stepper going to lose steps? I honestly don't know. I think for some reasonable speeds, this is gonna work. I think it's gonna be enough. I mean, there's no way we're gonna be threading at eight threads per inch at over a thousand RPM. It would be terrifying. Um, obviously, we'll have to have some protections in software to keep it inside of bounds and to do something reasonable if the operator does something unreasonable. But in practice, the primary risk with the stepper motor is just losing steps because there is no closed loop. The microcontroller has no idea what's going on here, and if it loses steps, it loses steps, and we won't know, and we'll be out of sync with the thread. But I think the only real way to know if that's gonna be a big problem is gonna to be to actually hook it up and try it on the real lathe. And uh, like I think I mentioned last time, I don't have the parts yet. They are still in shipping. I've got tracking numbers. I can see them making progress, but they're not in my hands yet, so I can't actually put it on the lathe. In the meantime, let's take a look at the servo motor and talk about how that's different and how that may solve some of these problems with the open loop stepper driver. This is a NEMA 23 servo motor. Now, the difference between a servo motor and a stepper motor, in this case, is a couple of differences. The most important one is that it has an encoder here on the back. 
So instead of just one cable going to the driver, we actually have two. And this second cable is hooked to an encoder that's on a second shaft on the back of the motor. I'm not gonna take this apart because I don't wanna damage it. Um, uh, these are not particularly expensive for what they are. The motor has the encoder on the back and then the driver has an encoder input. And this has a 32-bit DSP, probably not unlike the one on my dev board down here. And in addition to driving the motor, in this case a three-phase motor with UV and W wires, in addition to driving the motor to the correct position, it's also monitoring the encoder so that it knows what position the motor is in. And it is immune essentially from losing steps, at least losing steps without knowing that it's lost steps. So this is programmable. There's an RS-232 port on the end. And you can, I think, actually set these up so that it gets position data over RS-232. But I'm just using it to program it. You'll note there's a couple of dip switches here, but there's no dip switches for micro-stepping. So what I've done is I've already connected this, and I've set this up to be in 1,000 steps per revolution mode. So the encoder actually has 1,000 lines, which means it can count 4,000 positions per revolution, but I don't need that kind of resolution because I'm actually going to use a belt drive to the lead screw with this and step it down three to one, so I don't need that kind of resolution for sure. So I set this to 1,000 steps per revolution, and then we'll need to multiply the number of pulses we send to it by three because it's gonna be geared down three to one as well. Let me get this hooked up. Uh, the, this works exactly the same way as the stepper driver. We've got the pulse, direction, and enable lines, just like on the stepper driver. This one also has uh, an alarm, the signal that comes back. I don't have that hooked up yet, but I think we can get this thing into an alarm condition. I can show you what happens when that, when that occurs. Let me hook this up. Okay, I've got the servo all hooked up to the driver. I've got the power connected to the, the three leads for the three phase motor connected to the three outputs here. I've got the power connected to the power supply and I have the encoder connected back to the encoder. Now the connections to the microcontroller are exactly what we talked about before. We've just got the same FET switch driving the same kind of optical input in the driver. And this should all be working. Yep. There are a few differences between the servo and the stepper motor. And one, of course, is the encoder. This is a closed loop system that cannot lose steps. Or at least if it does lose steps, the driver will know about it and will raise the alarm and stop the motor. And so we don't have to worry about that. The other big difference here is that for the same size motor, this thing produces less torque than the stepper. This stepper motor produces about four Newton meters of torque. This servo is only two Newton meters of torque. But what it loses in torque, it makes up for in speed. This thing can run a lot faster while retaining its torque curve than the stepper motor ever can. So what that means is we can run this faster and gear it down. So I've ordered the right pulleys to gear this down three to one to the lead screw. I think that's probably gonna be about right. And that's how I have the software in the microcontroller configured right now, assuming it's gonna be three to one but I also ordered the right belts for two to one and we can try them both and see what the trade-offs are. It all comes down to a trade-off between speed and torque. So if I go two to one, I get a higher top speed. If I go three to one, I get more torque and we need to get it on the machine, actually open and close the half nut, take some cuts and find out what's gonna be actually needed. So if I put this in threading mode and put it down to 12 threads per inch, if we were running the stepper motor one to one, you would turn the lead screw once and get one revolution on the stepper. With the servo, it should go around three times because I've changed that ratio. One, two, three. Yep, so that's working. So as a result then, when I flick this, you can see that that motor is going quite a lot faster and you know, <laughs> moving itself around the table, but it's not having any trouble with the lost steps. Now, if I flick this hard enough, I can make it lose steps but instead of just losing steps and continuing to run, the driver is actually going to kill it. Now keep in mind, this is running three times the speed of that stepper. 
there, and I finally got it to, got it to uh, actually freeze. Now what's happened, I don't know if you can see it, but there's an LED flashing right down here on the driver, and that's the alarm LED telling me that the, the driver has lost sync with the motor. And that's just because the error in position between where the driver was trying to drive it to and where the motor actually was, was greater than the threshold. That's all configurable and that's something that we may need to tune. But in order to clear the alarm, I will power cycle this. I should unplug it and wait for it to power down. Big capacitors in the power supply. There, it's down. And now we're back. But the thing to keep in mind though is this is still running three times the speed of that step that that stepper was and it's not losing steps. So I think this is gonna be practical. We're gonna to have to see what it actually comes down to when we get it on the lathe and see whether the lower torque with the higher gear ratio works well or not. Um, and that is just gonna to have to wait until the pulleys get here. Hopefully by the time you see me again, I will have those. <laughs> I love this thing, this is a lot of fun. Well, that's all I have for today. We are getting really close to being ready to put this on the lathe. In fact, I think I'm about at that point now. I just need the pulleys. And as soon as they get here, we can start looking at the mechanical install and actually getting this thing running on the lathe and see how this is gonna work end to end. I am really looking forward to that. I feel like the software is in good shape. I feel like all of the electrical stuff is in good shape. I don't see any major issues there, but there are going to be a ton of complications that come up once the theory meets the real world on the lathe. Uh, is, the, is this gonna have enough torque? Is two to one or three to one the right ratio? Um, are we gonna lose steps or, or freeze the alarm on the servo driver when we engage the half nut? This has been done before. There are commercial products. I'm confident we can work all that out but I'm also a little anxious to actually get this connected and start working through that. So if you're enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and keep the comments coming. Uh, the conversations in the comment threads and the conversations in the GitHub repository where the codes is hosted have been very enlightening. There have been some really good suggestions, including the uh, suggestion to check out the servo instead of just trying the stepper. Uh, there's a bunch of suggestions in there about graphical LCDs. I actually ordered one and I have it and I'm playing with that as a possibility for the user interface. There's a whole bunch of stuff coming and the conversations have been very interesting. Um, there's a wide variety of opinions and there's a wide variety of suggestions for how other people would approach this project and I think that's great. Keep the comments coming. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.